The consequences of the 14th century's natural and human-made disasters brought quite a bit of change to Europe. And yet, as pretty much always happened, some elements of life remained much the same. This was true even of places that experienced momentous intellectual shifts, such as Italy. Today's lesson provides a brief overview of the Italian Renaissance, the biggest intellectual shift of the 14th and 15th centuries. Let's start with one of the philosophical mindsets that was consistent between the late Middle Ages and the Renaissance, the concept of the great chain of being. The great chain of being is the idea that everything that exists in the universe had its place in a divinely planned hierarchical order, it was called the Great Chain of Being because it was imagined as a chain vertically extended between the divine and secular realms. An objects or organism's place on the chain depended on the proportion of spirit to matter that it contained. The more matter and less spirit an object contained, the lower down it stood on the chain. Thus, at the bottom of the chain stood the various inanimate objects created by God that contained very little spirit metals, stones, the four elements of earth, water, air, and fire. Near the bottom, but believed to contain more spirit, was the earth's flora, its plants. Just above that was all of the earth's animals, its fauna, which were in turn surpassed by humans. Above humans were supernatural beings with more spirit than matter, like angels. God was, of course, made wholly of spirit, but able to take on any form he wished, and he was at the top of the chain. Other, internal hierarchies existed within these larger categories. Gold, for instance, was believed to be the metal with the most amount of spirit, so it was at the top of the metal hierarchy. In Europe, the science of alchemy, which persisted well into the 18th century, was partly based on the idea that one could change lead into gold by infusing it with more spirit. Closely tied to the idea of the great chain of being was the doctrine of correspondences, which held that individual parts of the chain reflected the whole. For example, Renaissance thinkers believed that a human being was a microcosm of the world as a whole. Just as the world was composed of four elements, water, air, earth, and fire, the human body was composed of four humors, each of which corresponded to one of the four elements. Most physicians believed that illness was caused by an imbalance among the humors. Correspondences were found everywhere and on scales large and small. In humans, the mental faculties, or reason, which was considered a male attribute, were supposed to rule the emotions, which were considered a female attribute. Philosophers believed it was partly this ability to regulate emotion using reason that set humans above animals. A society also reflected the doctrine of correspondences. Just as God ruled over humankind, so should men, and specifically fathers, rule over their families, especially their female relatives. And, in the same correspondence, monarchs, usually kings, should rule over all of their subjects. In this way, many Renaissance writers emphasized the connection between political order and sin, someone who goes against the king was considered immoral, a sinner. Of course, everyday people weren't explicitly educated in the great chain of being, but they learned and reinforced community norms nonetheless. While the influence of religious institutions generally wanes over the 14th and 15th centuries, the authority of local religious figures remains very much in place. The local priests and acknowledged local religious figures had immense influence over the regulation of norms within villages and towns. This religious influence was likely one reason why society remained so patriarchal. Society was ordered by men. Social norms, those written and unwritten rules of behavior that people figure out by living in their communities, were learned and reinforced regularly. Sometimes, leisure activities were used to reinforce communal norms and bonds. The celebration of religious holidays like saints' days were a communal affair. Villagers didn't work, and their lords were usually expected to provide food and drink for the celebration. This was a way to remind the nobles of their traditional promise to provide for their workers. Of course, those found to be in violation of social norms were punished, 
and often publicly. They were sentenced to whipping or branding or to time spent in the stocks in the village square. Sometimes, well-meaning celebratory practices morphed into practices of public humiliation. On the European continent, a particular ritual known as charibari, organized by village women, initially allowed villagers to celebrate newlyweds in an embarrassing way. On their first night at home together, the villagers would get together and bang household items such as pans as a serenade to the new couple, a sort of wink-wink, we know what you're doing in there kind of prank. The depiction on the screen even shows people in costume during charibari. At some point though, charibari changed and was instead a way for villagers to express their disapproval of a marriage they considered unnatural, such as when a widower were married too quickly. Charibari was also used outside the homes of known or suspected adulterers or domestic abusers. In some parts of Europe, villagers dragged the suspected male adulterer outside and forced him to run before him like a stag. They would then chase him as mock hunters. Once caught, the man was beaten. That was their justice served. Of course, even as many social norms remained the same, other practices changed. In Europe's countryside, and most visibly in England, the biggest change that everyday people saw was in landholding practices. Sometime in the late 13th century, English landholders, overwhelmingly nobles, began to put up hedges or fences around their lands. This English enclosure movement was slowly accompanied by increasing restrictions on those enclosed lands. As more land was enclosed, non-landholders, especially poorer peasants and serfs, were limited in which lands they could use. Enclosure began to chip away at land that had traditionally been held in common, that is, land that had been available for all villagers to use as cropland. And this limitation reduced how much food peasants and serfs had access to. Then, landholders began to restrict access to forested areas and to water sources, so peasants and serfs couldn't hunt or fish for additional food either. Sometimes, wealthier peasants, often those who worked in important positions in a noble household, were able to buy land and enclose it. They then worked the land independently as farmers, or they rented some of their land to other peasants. These landholders, now known as yeomen, became a new class of people in England. In Europe's cities, the guild system remained the main institution governing everyday people's actions. Guilds were associations of craftsmen or merchants who banded together to establish business rules in their cities. Guild members often lived in the same neighborhoods, they attended the same churches, and of course, they worked together to educate the next generation of craftsmen and merchants through apprenticeship. Guilds were also responsible for maintaining infrastructure in their cities. They built and maintained roads and bridges, and they were also often tasked with maintaining sections of the city walls. And yet, as important as the guilds were, cracks nonetheless began to emerge in the system. Tensions between the craftsmen and merchant guilds, especially between the textile manufacturers and the merchants, began to emerge as time progressed. As some merchants realized that they could sidestep the guild system's regulations if they essentially outsourced the production of textiles through the cottage or domestic system. Rather than purchasing textiles from a weaver and selling it, merchants began to purchase the raw materials, wool or cotton, and deliver it to a peasant in the countryside who had learned how to spin. The peasant spinner would turn the raw materials into thread or yarn, which the merchant would then deliver to a peasant who knew how to weave cloth. After the cloth was made, the merchant would pick it up and sell it, earning a much higher profit since he could pay peasants, who were essentially working as gig workers, less than guild-affiliated weavers back in the city. So it's amidst this backdrop, one of significant continuities and a few changes, that the Italian Renaissance, which began about 1350 and would continue to 1600, was born. Uh, you've read about the main philosophical shift, the adoption of humanism, that helped bring about the Renaissance. In Italy, humanism manifested itself as a civic duty, a responsibility to develop oneself in a way that brought glory to their hometown. 
Italian humanists like Pico della Mirandola hoped that their art would make not just themselves famous, but their cities as well. Of course, the Renaissance is most closely associated with the flowering of art and architecture. Now, the roots of this new artistic movement were evident in the work of Giotto, a medieval Florentine painter whose works began to explore perspective and the effects of light on his paintings. He used a technique called chiaroscuro, in which he uses light and shadow to try to create dimension, perspective, in his works. His frescoes demonstrate a painter who is interested in individualizing each person he depicts. Their faces, their clothing, sometimes even their poses, are all different. In the middle of the 15th century, another Florentine, Donatello, would sculpt Europe's first freestanding figure since classical times. His David showcases how humanists were passionately interested in the different disciplines that affected their main work. Donatello had to study the human body carefully. He had to understand how the muscles play underneath the skin in order to create such a realistic image of a teenager in triumph over the giant Goliath. You can see this understanding in how Donatello is standing. Donatello seems relaxed, his left foot resting on Goliath's head. But notice how his stance affects the body as a whole. In order to bend his left leg as he does, Donatello's weight has to rest on his right leg. And look at the way Donatello has contracted the muscle there. David's right hip is canted just a bit to the side as well to help him maintain a center of gravity. This pose, a slight S to the human body, is called contraposto. Now look at his arms. Look at how his left biceps bulges just a bit as he rests the back of his left hand on his hip. He's holding his slingshot in that hand. And notice how his right forearm and biceps are also contracted to hold on to the hilt of the sword. The entire sculpture is evidence of how closely Donatello studied the human body. Yet another Florentine, Michelangelo, was able to translate his understanding of the human form not just into sculpture. It's Michelangelo's version of the David that probably is the image that first springs to the mind of many students of Renaissance art. But Michelangelo also did this in painting. A Michelangelo is the artist responsible for the artwork which covers the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, which was painted at the beginning of the 16th century, about 50 or so years after Donatello sculpted his David. We're going to look at this image right here. One of the most famous of his frescoes in that ceiling is known as the Creation of Adam, which depicts Adam and God nearly touching one another. Adam is unclothed to follow the biblical story, and the depiction of his body as he reclines on a mountainside is a masterful study in how muscles move. Adam's left leg is bent at the knee and all of his muscles, even the tendons around his knee, are bulging accordingly. In contrast, his right leg is stretched out at rest, and so only a hint of the muscle underneath is depicted. The muscles of his right shoulder are bunched to show the support of weight of the torso on that arm. Michelangelo's depiction of God, shown as an older gray-haired man and clothed, still showcases the powerful musculature underneath a tunic that's plastered to his body by the wind. Michelangelo's god, despite the gray hair and beard which is likely meant to symbolize wisdom, is portrayed as a man in his prime. After the end of the Hundred Years' War, the new philosophies and artistic forms of the Italian Renaissance spread north and sparked the Northern Renaissance, which would run from about 1450 until 1600. In the northern parts of Europe, Renaissance ideals would sometimes be revised to accommodate another shift occurring at the time, the Reformation. Still, artistic techniques were shared throughout Europe, even if the subject matter of the art itself shifted. The Renaissance era in Europe was still a very religious time, but often northern artists chose to move away from explicitly religious subject matter and portray everyday people. One of the earliest Northern Renaissance artists hailed from the Netherlands. Jan van Eyck 
developed a style which so faithfully recreated the objects and creatures of the natural world that his paintings often appear almost like photographs. Probably, Probably Jan Van Eyck's most famous, famous piece, piece is the is Arnold, Arnold Feeney portrait, portrait, which he painted, which he painted in 1434. 1434. It's a large, it's a large painting, painting, almost three almost feet, three by, two feet, feet by two feet in size, in size and its detail, and its is, detail stunning. is stunning. The portrait is the believed portrait is to portray the marriage of Giovanni Arnolfini, Arnolfini, a northern Italian, a northern Italian merchant, merchant who lived for a time, lived for a time in Flanders. Flanders. Current and scholarship suggests that this is a memorial portrait. That is, there's only evidence that Arnolfini married once, to a fellow Italian named Costanza Trenta. However, she died in 1433, a year before this painting was done. So, it's possible that Van Eyck painted this image with only one model, Arnolfini, actually present. If so, then its detail is even more impressive. Let's take a closer look, specifically at that mirror on the back wall. Now here's a detail of the convex mirror on that back wall. At first glance, it's dark, but clearly reflecting some images. It seems like a decoration on the wall, like any other mirror. But as you get closer and then closer still, you're going to notice an incredible amount of detail just in this mirror. But first, you probably noticed that there's some writing just above the mirror. It's a Latin phrase that translates to Jan van Eyck was here in 1434. It's an unusual way to sign a painting, but hey, to each their own. But now let's look at that mirror. In the reflective part of the mirror itself, you suddenly see quite clearly a reflection of the entire room. The backs of Arnolfini and his wife are visible, as is the artist himself. He's wearing blue, he's in the middle of the mirror, He's depicted as he presumably works on this very painting. There's even another figure wearing red right behind him. It's an amazing amount of detail in reverse, and it further showcases Van Eyck's talent. Moreover, take a look at the smaller circular insets all the way around the mirror. Each of them also depicts a scene. These 10 images are scenes from the biblical telling of the passion of Jesus, that is, the story of Jesus' criminal conviction and his death. The topmost scene is of Jesus' crucifixion, his death. Keep in mind that the depiction of this mirror as a whole is only about 10 centimeters in height. That's about four inches. Jan Van Eyck was able to paint incredible detail in just four inches of his total portrait. Van Eyck's style and subject matter was hugely influential with Northern Renaissance artists, many of whom chose to work in portraiture. However, about 50 years after Van Eyck died, another Netherlandish artist moved in a completely different direction. Hieronymus Bosch's work focused on the fantastical and the grotesque. Some modern critics see him as a precursor to the surrealist art of the early 20th century. Bosch's most famous triptych, that means a three-part panel, is this painting called The Garden of Earthly Delights, which depicts an innocent Adam and Eve in Eden on the left, the horrific vices of Eden after the pair has eaten from the tree of knowledge in the middle, and the clear aftermath of such activity, that is, going to hell, on the right panel. This return to an explicitly religious subject matter was typical of artists in the early 16th century, which coincides with the start of the Protestant Reformation. Adherence to religious subjects is especially true for artists involved in religious groups, as Bosch was. As the Renaissance drew to a close, the idealized realism of typical Renaissance artwork was briefly eclipsed in Italy during the late 16th century by a new movement, Mannerism, a style which demonstrated the artist's knowledge of reality, but distorted figures and used often bold color to convey emotion. For Mannerists, Imagination and intuition was more important than a faithful reproduction of content. The most famous of the Mannerists was El Greco, a Greek artist who lived and worked in Spain. El Greco's given name was Domenico Theotokopoulos. He was born in Crete, which then belonged to the Republic of Venice. In 1577, after studying in Venice and in Rome, El Greco moved to Madrid and later Toledo, where he would live out the rest of his life. El Greco painted what are sometimes called moody scenes, 
lots of gray and black clouds over the landscape, or images of sad events like the death of Jesus. Here, in El Greco's second Pietà painting, you can see that El Greco has a clear grasp of human depiction, just as all well-known Renaissance artists did. But he's purposely distorting the proportions of the bodies, especially that of Jesus. Jesus' torso, which his mother Mary is cradling, is enormous, perhaps to evoke how heavy a burden having to bury your child is. Color and light are also used in both literal and symbolic ways. The whole painting is dark. There's just the faintest hint of light over Mary Magdalene's shoulder. Everyone's skin tone is sort of gray, but notice that both women, as well as the Apostle John, have a pink tint to their skin. They're alive, whereas Jesus' skin has a blue tint to it. He's dead. The overall feeling of this piece is one of sadness, maybe a sadness that is still too deep for tears. There was an enormous amount of artistic learning and creation packed into the centuries of the Renaissance. And what's really remarkable about that is the fact that this artistic flourishing occurred amidst a backdrop of political and religious change, including the end of the Hundred Years' War, the European Age of Exploration, and the Protestant Reformation. Perhaps that goes to show that times of immense turmoil can also be times of immense creativity.